In most of this course, our focus has been on fields of characteristic zero, that is fields whose, whose prime field is the field of rational numbers. In this video, we're going to start heading along a little bit of a different tangent, which is how do we construct and analyze finite fields? You're already familiar with one example or, or a class of examples of finite fields. That is the fields Z mod P where P is prime. So for any prime number P, we can construct the ring Z mod P and that ring turns out to be a field because it's actually an integral domain and every finite integral domain is a field. So that's one class of examples and these have order P where P is the prime that we selected. But did you know that there are also there are also fields of order p to the k for every prime p and every integer k greater than or equal to one? And we're soon going to learn how to construct those. There's actually a systematic method for constructing any of those. But in this video, I want to talk about just how we might construct some of these fields just using what we know from the work we've done previously. So for example, suppose we want a field of order 9. We want to construct a field of order 9. So one question we might ask ourselves first is, what should be the prime field? So what is the prime field? If there is a field of order 9, then what prime field should serve as its foundation? And then another question we might ask is, what is the degree of our field? that is our field of order nine over the prime field. Okay, uh, so two questions to answer. Well, the prime field can be any Z mod P. Remember our prime field, our choices are gonna be the rationals or Z mod P. If I choose the rationals as my prime field, then my field is gonna contain all, of the, all of the different rational numbers. And so its order is gonna be much more than nine. It's gonna be infinite. So I have to choose some Z mod P. Uh, so this is gonna be Z mod P for some prime p. And then the degree, let's just call that d for now. Let's say our degree of our field of order 9 is going to be d over the prime field z mod p. Well then, if my prime field has order p, and the degree of my field as an extension over the prime field is d, I think I could figure out what the order of my field would have to be in terms of p and d. And that's because our field is a vector space is a vector space over z mod p of dimension d. So it has a basis. And that basis will have exactly d elements. And then each element of f, each element of our field, is uniquely of the form Uh, let's call it C1A1 up through CDAD, where C1 through CD, those are elements or scalars from the base field, from Z mod P. Okay, so when I think about elements of my field, those are going to have this form. I'm going to be able to choose this scalar, this scalar, this scalar, all the way through up to this scalar. And I have P choices for each scalar, which means... The total number of choices I have for an element of f is going to be p to the dth power because I have to make d choices and each time I have p options. So my field has order p to the d. That is p being the uh, the prime from which I got z mod p, the, the prime field, and then d, the degree of my field over the prime field. So if I want my field to have order nine, then I need p to the d to equal nine, which means I need p to equal three and d to equal two. So I need to construct an extension field over z mod three that has degree two. How am I going to do that? Well, the way that we've always done this, if we wanted to construct a field of degree whatever 
over some field is we adjoin the root of an irreducible polynomial. And that is exactly what we will do here. All right, so let's try constructing an irreducible polynomial of degree two over z mod three. Now the good news here is if I can just set up my polynomial p of x, uh, let's call it a2x squared plus a1x plus a0. If I could just construct this so it has no roots, that would be enough because I have degree two. If this were to factor, if this polynomial factored, it would factor into two linear polynomials, which would mean it had roots. So if I can just get one of these to have no roots, then I win. All right, and I can always pick A2 to be one because if I have an irreducible polynomial of degree two at all, I can rescale it so that it's monic. So let's just take that choice out of the uh, out of the system of complications here. So now I just need to pick A1 and A0 so that my polynomial is irreducible. And in fact, I know that A0 probably shouldn't be equal to zero because if it were, then I'd have x squared plus something times x. I could factor out an x, I'd have a root of zero. None of that would be good for irreducibility. So let's just arbitrarily pick a naught to be one. Not to say that that's an arbitrary choice. I mean, let's just pick because we don't know whether one or two would be more strategic at this point. And then what are we gonna put here? Well, I think that if I put an x, then I'm gonna have a root of one. x squared plus x plus one would be zero mod three when x is equal to one. I could try two x. But then I'm going to have another problem. This is going to be x plus 1 quantity squared. So I'm going to try x squared plus 0x plus 1 and hope for the best. So p of x is going to be x squared plus 1. All right, I believe that will have no roots. If I try x equals 0, it's non-zero. If I try x equals 1, I get p of 1 equals 2. p of 2 is also equal to 2, so this has no roots. Therefore, because it has degree 2, it's irreducible. So I could let alpha represent a root of x squared plus one of that p of x over z mod three. Not to say that the root belongs to z mod three, but it's in an extension of z mod three. And then consider z mod three adjoint alpha. If you don't like that, if you don't like this, well, why can we let alpha be a root? Then do this instead. Take z mod 3, adjoint x, and mod out by the ideal generated by x squared plus 1. Same deal there. It's going to be isomorphic. So then I have z mod 3, adjoint alpha, which means this is the field consisting of all a, uh, let's call it a naught plus a1 alpha. Sorry, kind of unfortunate choice of coefficients there, uh, such that a naught and a1 both belong to z mod 3. Well, how many elements does that have? Uh, if our whole framework up here is correct, like if we thought through this correctly, then we should have three to the second number of elements. That should be nine, but let's check. So I have these two elements here, one and alpha, that are linearly independent. So I can check, uh, I can choose a0 and a1 independently. I can pick zero, one, or two for this. I can pick zero, one, or two for this. Let's write that down. 0, 1, or 2, 0, 1, or 2. Each of those will give me a different element. So I have 3 times 3, which is a total of 9 different elements. And we can actually create addition tables and multiplication tables for this field. I'm not going to do that whole construction in this video. I'm trying to keep this fairly short. But let's just illustrate how we might multiply in Z mod 3 adjoint alpha. So let's say I have two elements, uh, kind of non-boring ones. So let's say like 2 plus alpha and then one plus two alpha. That's probably a good exercise there. All right, if I multiply these, then what do I get? Well, over characteristic zero, I would get two uh, plus alpha plus four alpha plus two alpha squared. Because I am working over Z mod three, all addition is mod three. So this is really two plus, and this is an alpha, and this is like another alpha here. So that's gonna amount to two alpha. Sorry, that's two alpha and then two alpha squared. But now wait, what about alpha squared? We didn't say anything about alpha squared when we set this up. 
Uh, hopefully I can translate that into something of the form alpha naught plus alpha one, or sorry, a naught plus a one alpha. Boy, that was really regrettable, a and alpha. Anyway, so uh, well, what do I do with alpha squared? Well, remember that alpha was a root of the polynomial x squared plus one, which means alpha squared plus one is equal to zero. So alpha squared is really just negative one. In that sense, alpha behaves just like i in the complex number system. So this is two plus two alpha minus two, which comes out to just two alpha, which is pretty cool. All right, so anyway, that's an example of how we do multiplication in this field. Uh, in the next video, we will talk about the structure of the multiplicative group of units in a finite field.